Nikki. Um, I'm an undergraduate at the University of Miami, majoring in my marine bio biology and chemistry. Um, and today I'm going to um, talk to you a little bit about uh, the diversity of formate dehydrogenase proteins in hydrothermal vent microbes. Uh, <laughs> second. Okay, one second. <laughs> it's not switching. No worries. You are the last speaker of this session, so <laughs> <laughs> at least we see it. Um... Um, I'm going to try exiting. There we go. Let's see. Did that switch it on? Yeah, we're yeah we're in the uh, the, the Google Slides view now. Oh, okay. Um, let's see. Yeah, so if the slideshow won't work, we can just show it from this as well. There we go. Now there switch. Go. Cool. While I'm on Zoom. Okay. I don't know what's going on there. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, um, so basically, um. Um, I'm looking at the hydrothermal vent environment and the microbes that live on them. And specifically, I'm looking at formate um, at formate dehydrogenase, uh, which oxidizes formate into carbon dioxide. Um, and it's a really important um, aspect of hydrothermal vent um, environments because it's a lot more uh, abundant than it would be in a lot of other environments. Um, and that's interesting because um, Organic carbon compounds don't usually form abiotically. Um, so for a little analogy, um, if you want to make cheese, uh, you wouldn't really just leave a bucket of milk out and for an hour room temperature room and hope it just suddenly turns into cheese. It might just be like spoiled milk, um, but you wouldn't expect it to form that more complex structure. Um, and that's, uh, you would need uh, something to, uh, a, a perfect environment and the perfect conditions to make that structure. Um, so, um, like, way, way back, they would use, like, animal animal stomachs to, to do that, to give, give that specific um, set of conditions for that to happen. And that's the same case um, with organic compounds like formate. You can't just take the raw mater materials and form it. You have to have that uh, perfect set of conditions um, in the middle, um, which in this case is a hydrothermal vent. Um, it's very alkaline, which gives it that reducing environment to turn carbon dioxide into formate. Um, and it's also highly pressurized and it's got a little bit of an elevated temperature. And so this is important for our microbial ecology on the hydro hydrothermal vents um, because there's an abundance of some chemicals that aren't really found um, in high abundances anywhere else. So things like hydrogen, methane, and of course formate, which we want to focus on um, for this project. Um, so various archaea and bacteria are using these sources of energy and carbon um, for themselves to survive. So some examples would be methanogens and sulfate reducers as different taxa that we would um, be looking at. Um, so to compare this to what we have here on the surface, um, a lot of um, what, what, what you need to get that organic carbon is uh, photosynthesis. It's a, that light catalyzed reaction to get your organic carbon from CO2 um, in, in addition to energy. And then uh, down in the deep, it's kind of a little bit flipped. You start with the organic um, compound, the formate, you pull it into the microbe, um, and you're getting that energy and CO2 um, in response, um, as well as byproducts like acetate. And so I based my project on a 2022 paper um, that looked at the meta metabolisms of different uh, microbes on hydrothermal vents. So um, basically, um, all of the taxa um, were looked at um, and the, were categorized based on their metabolism. Um, so you can kind of get a sense here of how diverse um, it really is on those hydrothermal vents. You might see some of those methanogens and sulfate reducers if you look closely at the, the names. Um, but the important thing to note is that there are many different metabolisms like hydrogen metabolism, sulfate, uh, sulfur metabolism, and of course, formate meta met metabolism. And so um, when we're doing these, uh, the study, um, you're categorizing um, the genomes based on their taxa, and you're binning them into um, categories which are called mags. Um, so that's basically just the genomes collected into one um, category um, for you to analyze and look at the different metabolisms in each. 
Um, and so if you look at the figure, you can kind of see along the top the different metabolisms, um, ending with the formic metabolism on the right, highlighted in green. Um, and what's um, unique about that is that a lot of unusual FDH-like sequences were found that were specific to hydrothermal vent um, environments. Um, and that isn't shared by a lot of um, microbes in other environments. So you can kind of see that on this clade right here, or this uh, phylogenetic tree, where all of the, the samples from um, the same loca the location that was sampled, Lost City, um, they're all kind of occupy the same clade um, and have that same divergent FDH sequence. And so for my project, I basically did a similar thing to the original project, um, but I looked at the difference between the fluids um, given out by the chimneys and the chimneys themselves. So the location was the Lost City Hydrothermal Vent Field, um, which is located on the Atlantis Massive, kind of smack dab in the middle of the Atlantic. Um, and if you zoom in closer, you can kind of see it's right next to the Mid-Atlantic Ridge and uh, Atlantic, Atlantis Fracture Zone that allowed that mountain to kind of uplift. Um, and to get the samples, the ROV uh, called Jason was sent to um, get the fluids by sort of getting a tube to um, suck in the fluids um, and capture that. Um, and it also has an instrument that allows it to grab samples directly from the chimneys. So those are the two important things to know is um, the hydrothermal fluid samples and the chimney samples. Um, those are what we are com comparing for the project. Um, so this is kind of a visual of that. The fluids are the effluent kind of coming up from the subsurface and then the chimneys is kind of that crusty layer building up over time. So my hypothesis was basically that there would be a sign significant difference between the hydrothermal vent fluids and chimney sequences. Um, because um, if you look kind of deeper into it, the chemical um, composition of the subsurface compared to directly outside of the chimney where the fluids are is a little bit different. So I was thinking um, maybe um, microbes would, would evolve or um, pass on genes um, to reflect this difference in chemical um, composition. So some important questions to think about um, throughout this project was whether this would have ecolog ecological significance, uh, bringing more di diversity to the microbial uh, ecosystem, um, and what biochemical pathways could be implied by these novel sequences. And also, it's really important to think of how these FDH sequences evolved in the first place, um, because that could have um, really important implications astrobiologically, because um, you're forming um, these, uh, you're evolving these sequences in a unique environment that might be found on other planets. So this project was based on metagenomics. So uh, basically, if you're not familiar with that, you take your whole sample um, and all the gene genomes within, and you assemble them um, and line up all the contigs, which are basically little snippets um, from each gene or each uh, region of the gene genome, um, and you basically line those up to get the um, a better sense of the gene region. Um, then you take those contigs and you bend them according to taxa to make it better, more organized, and better able to um, make you better able to pull those sequences that you want from them for your analysis. And this is a little bit more of a detailed uh, reiteration of what I just said. I can go back to that later if you have any questions. But um, basically for my project, um, again, I'm, uh, <laughs> again, I'm comparing fluids and chimney sequences. So I look at the fluid sequences first. Um, and then I pick out those sequences that are for F the FDH um, proteins. Um, and then I look at the chimney um, mags themselves, and I locate which which mags have um, reflections of those FDH sequences. Um, and so once I have identified those, I'm, I'm able to pull those out using a grep search and uh, make a new data set with the chimney uh, chimney sequences. And so I constructed a phylogenetic tree after doing this blast search. Um, and collecting the chimney contigs, um, I merged it with the fluid sequences um, from the original 2022 paper. Um, and then I did an alignment using uh, Clustal Omega. And I built the tree using RaxML, the RaxML program, and I annotated it with the interactive tree of life. 
And so this is um, sort of my main figure for this. Um, so you can see from the phyl phylogenetic tree, um, the fluids are in orange and the chimneys are sequences are in blue. Um, and if you look at the figure we looked at before from the original paper, um, again, you see that big plate um, with all the lost city fluid sequences um, kind of occupying the same clade. And you see that um, in the in the new phylogenetic tree as well, which is to be expected because you also have the fluids fluid sequences here too. But the ch chimney sequences are also grouped into that. So these chimney sequences are going to be more or less similar to the fluids. There might not be big differences. Maybe if you have a little bit longer of a branch length between the two, there will be a little bit of a difference. But other than that, they're pretty similar, um, but also still divergent from any other environment outside of higher thermal vents. Um, but then you also have these five down here, which are kind of outliers. They're, um, they're pulled away from the rest of the, the clade um, in a separate clade. Um, and so these may have their own even more divergent um, functions and um, biochemical pathways. And so to re reiterate the significance, um, some of these phylo or sorry, some of these FDH sequences may be phylogenetically distinct. So they um, it would be interesting to look further into that to see whether this um, this difference um, requires um, is is required for um, certain biochemical pathways for the evolution of um, microbes in this environment. And so some next steps would be to do a little bit of a deeper phylogenetic analysis um, and do to determine statistically um, how significant these deviations are um, in between the fluids and the chimneys. Um, and I'd also like to make comparisons between the chimney and fluid FDH sequences um, between different taxa. So looking specifically at methanogens and specifically at sulfate reducers and then comparing them, for instance. Um, and then, like I, like I said before, um, I'd like to kind of look deeper at whether um, novel pathways um, in biochemistry could be um, sort of uncovered when you look at um, these different um, modes of metabolizing formate, um, especially in different locations on the the the, the hydrothermal vent, um, because this ha um, implies a lot of diversity even within one um, small section of the uh, ocean. So we looked very specifically at hydrothermal vents, but there are other places that have novel microbial metabolisms um, in many different aspects. So you've got your hot springs, you've got other seeps at the bottom of the seafloor, um, and potentially even other planets. Um, and all of these are super interesting. Um, but uh, I'd like to focus a little bit on the planets because um, formate in particular, um, it can it is only formed abiotically, as I said before, under really special conditions. And with all the different arrays of planets out there with different pHs, different pressures, different temperatures, you can um, have so so many varieties of ways that um, organic carbon could be produced. Um, to make a ideal environment for these chemosynthetic microbes. Um, so thank you for listening. Um, and if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Awesome, great job, Nikki. If we have questions, we can ask them in the chat or raise our hands. I see Sanjoy already has a question. Hey, Nikki, thanks for this presentation. Really enjoyed it. So I think I have two questions. One, isn't formate just the reduction of CO2 with hydrogen? Is, is it more complicated than that? And then um, the, the, second, the second question is the, uh, the fact that the, there's difference between the hydrothermal, hydrothermal fluid and the chimneys. Uh, mm -hmm. Is it because on the other side of the chimneys, there's like oxygenated seawater and that like creates a redox gradient that affects things? Yeah. So uh, your first question was basically whether um, the is whether formate um is the redu or what was sorry what was your first question first of all <laughs> just to oh, repeat it, to make sure I'm just a source. 
Yeah. So, so in my mind, the formate is just hydrogen reacting with CO2. Is it more? Yeah. For that? So it's basically, yeah, it's, it's, re you're reducing CO2. Um, and that's, uh, the, the basic gist of it. Um, and that doesn't usually happen outside of that kind of very alkaline environment. Um, cause that allows it to, um, happen almost spontaneously. It just, um, it is reduced very easily in that environment. And that actually makes it so there are, there's not a lot of carbon dioxide there. So even if you did somehow have light um, in these environments, you, uh, your photosynthetic organism organisms wouldn't really have a very good chance anyway, because there wouldn't be CO2 to take in. Um, and then your second question was whether, um, the, about the difference between the two, um, and like what the specific chemical difference was, is that what yeah, it was? Just, that's right. Just curious why there's a difference in the first place. I'm wondering if it's the influence of oxygenated seawater on the other end of the chimney wall that's causing the differences. Yeah, that's that's a, a big difference. Um, I think uh, the main thing is that uh, the the chimneys themselves are very close to the subsurface environment, um, which has um, different um it basically serpentinization is occurring down there and so you might have that's basically where all the reactions are taking place so you may have some of your more um incomplete reactions or byproducts uh, occurring there um and then uh in the fluids you also have that um, incorporation of uh what what is in the ambient seawater um so yeah basically what you said is that um, with the fluids, you've got oxy more more oxygenated, um, but also some CO two coming in, coming in to be reduced. Thank you. Awesome. We have several questions in the chat, so I'll, I'll do my best here to get through them. Um, first, from Priya, um, she wondered if you found any um, halo archaea for one thing in your samples, and she also wants, wants to know what kind of tree program you used. Yeah, um, so I didn't find any halo archaea, um, or at least I didn't focus specifically on them. Um, with the time I had, I mostly focused on like um, methanogens and sulfate reducers. Um, but uh, if I were to look even further, um, I might find a couple samples, but um, overall I didn't see many, or I don't remember ever seeing those. If they were, they were like a small portion of, of the whole uh, list of samples, um, cause there are, there are a large var variety of taxa. Um, but yeah, um, I don't remember specifically any halo archaea, but that would be interesting to look at further. Um, and then, um, what was the second question? Uh, what kind of tree program you used? Oh yeah. So basically, um, I sort of did a rough tree using cluster, uh, omega, um, and then I also got the text file from that to plug into RaxML, which is a program that uh, basically gives you a tree um, and uh, a rough tree. Well, well yeah. And um, from there, I was able to sort of annotate it um, and adjust what the roots are and um, highlight different things using a website called the Interactive Tree of Life, which you can just type in on your web browser. Very cool. And then Gabby asked um, that, so she says uh, that Jason just did another dive last month. Uh, do you know if this analysis will be done again with new samples? Um, I haven't really, you mean the one, the previous month or an upcoming month? Another... I'm guessing maybe an upcoming, some upcoming missions. Okay. I, I know they did another expedition kind of at the beginning of the summer. Um, but I haven't really, really heard much about what's coming up later. Um, I'm sure you can definitely do a lot more um, of this with other samples, and that would be good to do more replicates because um, you never know if those uh, sort of outlier um, sequences were by accident or if that's a common occurrence. Very cool. Okay, I don't want to hold you too much longer. I know you've been kind of way over time here, but you do have one one more question from Ben Pauly. Uh, ben wants to know if one of the alternate environments you showed were brine pools, 
If so, is there an issue with the lack of external energy sources with driving the chemistry you're looking for? Yeah, uh, so you mean this one? Or yeah, that one? Mm -hmm. Is that the, okay. Um, yeah, so uh, I was kind of talking with these two pictures. Um, I was talking a little bit um, in general about just met uh, novel metabolisms in general. So you might um, get different uh, metab metabolisms other than utilizing formate. Um, I think um, with formate in particular, you really need that alkaline environment. So um, it may or may not be the case um, in the salt or the in the hot spring, um, but it would be interesting to look more at that. Um, I don't really know much about like hot, hot springs and what their specific conditions are, um, but if they have a high alkaline environment, um, I think it would be potentially be the case that um, microbes could like this could be there.